You go ahead. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming. I'm sorry. I'm gonna... So this program is started by Dr. McKinney and I many years ago. Unfortunately, now it's only me here. But we hope if you guys need it, I'm trying to continue that. Um, my topic about anticoagulation. Everybody with AFib recently, most of people, unless they're against, they take the blood and thinner. But the problem is everybody has a lot of confused when I need to take it, what situation I should stop it, and when I can resume it. So a lot of pressure I think is very interesting in daily life in the clinic. And I think American Society Heart Society is upgraded in 2009. Upgrade for guideline for anticoagulation is very interesting and very focused. A lot of situation we face in the clinic. So I want to present this situation to everybody tonight. And before I started the topic, and I want to give a brief information about the background of the atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is an aging disease. For me, is age is probably the most risk factors beyond the other medical. Is is continuous AFib 24 hours, seven days a week, more than seven days. This is we call this persistent AFib. Some people with AFib okay, I don't feel it, but whenever they have a monitor, they can say okay, on the daily AFib more than seven days, then it's called the persistent. If it's even longer, more than a month, a year, then we call the long-standing persistent. Some people have AFib persistent for five to six years, or well, sometimes ten years, fifteen years. And the permanent AFib, permanent AFib is means you are longer enough. And no matter what you do, conversion, innovation, medical treatment, it doesn't work for you. And you say, okay, I accept that. And I'm not doing any more invasive medication, procedure, or take medication anymore. Then I accept AFib is a chronic condition. So this is the way we call a problem. Or some people use chronic, that means we will get it. And we, we, no matter what we do, we cannot be any longer with it. So when we in clinic see a patient <coughs> is if usually the first thing we think, okay, what the kind of risk this patient face? Okay. The most major things we worry about metabolism because atrial fibrillation. Because when we have atrial fibrillation, the blood is turbulent in the heart, the heart is getting large and the very slow they build a cup. Ninety percent of people build the stroke is because there is a part we call the left appendage. The very the blood say they are very slow and cloud build and the blood is large and get analyzed. So usually the American Heart Association currently guidelines such as use this carefully score. We call the CHEP2 score, the best score. That means if you have age less than 65, it gives the score zero. If you have 65 to 1, 74 give the number one. If you have age larger than 75, we give the score of two. If you're female, it's unfair. We give you one. But usually if you're female, the risk increase your risk for stroke when you have age only when you're 65 years old. So anything we still calculate with female. But you will, we will know when we discuss the risk of stroke with patient in clinic, usually you're less than 75, we tell you, okay, there are chance for him because your female is less likely. If you have heart failure, and then we give one. It's usually talking about cystic heart failure. And hypertension, give one. No hypertension, zero. If you have previous minute or stroke, we give you a score is high, it's two. And if you know stroke or TIA, it's zero. Now they add the better, that means if you have a myocardial infarction previously, or you have a peripheral RT, that is you have carotid, back stenosis, femoral artery stenosis, bypass, then they give a con one. Debate question is if I have coronary disease but I never has a heart attack, do you count it with one? More and more data support if you have a severe significant coronary artery disease and the risk should be calculated in there. But when the chapter score first published many years ago, they do not account it back with coronary artery disease. But usually, I can it because more and more data is support. <coughs> this kind of patient also have a high risk. It should be counted as a stroke risk factor. So when you see, well, if I have a score one or zero, so the percentage is less than one percent. This is a stroke only. This is a combined stroke, GI, or systolic embolism. And this is why in this duration, the anticoagulation treatment is tricky. Because it's not zero, even your score is Zero, but your risk is still there, and but your bleeding risk is anticoagulation, coumadin, perfexazurab, probably annually around 2%. And your 
base bleeding or spinal bleeding with new anticoagulation, probably 0.7 to 0.8%. So you, you have to balance what my situation is, whether I have a more risk for bleeding or whether my risk for stroke. So, but when the score is getting higher and higher, you see the more benefit it works, sure. And this is a brief, I give a brief, uh, it's a very complex strip. This, this is the block, with, it is a chain, how we, the club form. And usually, <coughs> the blood and the anticoagulation is target different step of the chain in different area, including your warfarin, Perdexa, uh, Kumani. So this is, I just want to give, uh, most of, like we use Zerato, uh, Adequus is targeting this region. And uh, if uh, you use Perdexa, usually from here. If you use Kumani, then it's more a broad way, more including this region, probably the most common area. So this is just a give like idea. Our card build from the, we cut and until the Cloud build and block <coughs> block the bleeding is always like this chain happen, and the blood in the build in the heart is the same way. So all the anticoagulation we use in the clinic now is try to block in this region and to prevent the clot to form. So when you take the blood in usually, I use this score. You have different score, different people use different, but this is mo most common clinic use the score. How much risk if I take the blood thinner? If I have atrial fibrillation, I take the blood thinner. How much risk I have if I take the medication? So usually, use H is each different letter step represent a different uh, disease. So H look like H is hypertension. A like abdominal renal function or abnormal liver function. As S is like you have stroke or not. B is you have a previous bleeding or not. L is a libel. If you take Coumadin, your Coumadin always stable in the 2.0 to 3.0, or sometimes it's lower than 2 or frequent higher than 3. So this is also, if you're frequent higher than 3.0, then your risk for bleeding will be increased. If your elderly patient, larger than 65, it will give you a score. Do you take some other drug? What means? Do you take Plavix? Do you have a stent? Do you take aspirin? If you take these things, do you take like Advil, right? Some people even take a lot of mm, herbs, then can cause the decrease their bleeding. Uh, I I heard one of the doctors in it's a renal doctors. He has a patient who continue bleeding, bleeding, and they know why because ask that. Um, what do you put in the coffee? Uh, there is a creamer. Not cream, it's, a, sure. like a, a, sure. it's a wood, it's from the, sure. the trees. Sure. The sure. trees. Sure. Sure. Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Oh. Yeah. Oh, cinnamon. So he, one guy buy a lot of large amount of cinnamon <coughs> from the Costco. So he eat tons tons of the everybody, everything he eat, he put on the uh, cinnamon. Like and then he cause tons of bleeding until they figure out, and when they start this bleeding, Stop. Usually, a small amount probably fine, but a lot of people will take a large amount and then they cost bleeding. So, you have to be careful. If you drink a lot of alcohol, also increase your risk. So, when you see, when you have a bleeding risk, one or two is probably just the one or two percent each year in 100 person. But if your high score is like five, your risk will be high. There is about six, seven, eight, but nobody have a data, so we do not present at this region. So when you see the patient and when you decided whether we take the blood thinner or not the blood thinner, <coughs> so you have to use this two score, give a balance, whether the patient is more prone to bleeding or more prone to a stroke. So then we'll make the decision. This is just the last couple of months to publish the AIG, the update data for from 2014 about guideline for managing the AFib. Major things I like in this slide I did not borrow them is because answer a lot of questions patients continue to ask. So I just try to present major things is probably help you to manage your daily life. If I have a surgery, what I do? If I don't take blood thinner, what I do? And what situation I have to bridge with love or not? So all the slide probably talk about this. So this is the guideline. If you have AFib and your chest score is about 
two in men. Okay, we, we see the score before. Or three, include the female if you count three, no matter what, how, what your age, if you count three, then you need to take the blood thinner. So if you're a man, say, okay, I have hypertension, now I'm 65, now your score is two. Or a woman said, I'm 65, I have to have tension, but I'm female. So there will be three. Then, if you have no significant bleeding history before, then you should take the blood thinner. Either you choose warfarin, or Pradexa, or uh, Zerato, Adequus, or Savisa. It depends on the physician choice, or person choice, or sometimes insurance coverage choice. But there is a situation you have to be aware. If you have a mechanical heart valve, some people have a mechanical aortic valve, mechanic mitral valve, you cannot take it. Also in the new guideline, put on this, if you have a moderate or severe mitral valve stenosis because of the calcification, you are not qualified for the new agent like Protexa, Zerato, uh, Adequates. You probably have to go back to old Kuhlman because there is no data supported to use and prevent the stroke with the new agents. So this is the two things. If you, this is why, when you take the new agents like Adequus, Pradexa, or Zerato, you have to make sure your mitral valve uh, is not severe, calcified, and narrowing. If in that situation, then you probably discuss with your doctor to see what I go back to cool. And this is probably everybody know when they take Kumani. In the first couple of weeks, you probably every week to check your blood, make sure you're therapeutic. And after you're therapeutic, and then you can they do it every once a month. Some people are doing very well with the home monitor by themselves, <coughs> and some people have to go to the doctor's clinic to get the monitor. So this is, we talk about chest score, this is just talk chest score to use the risk, uh, stroke risk evaluation when you see the patient. It's a class one, so that means everybody should do this before we talk about blood thinner. And when you have a mechanical valve, then you have to use warfarin, not a protexa. So. This is what we talked before. When you make decision whether we need on the blood thinner to prevent stroke or embolize, or we, we have to discuss with the patient what situation is. Whether you come paroxysmal, or permanent, persistent, no matter what it is, you should on the blood thinner. Doesn't mean I just have one hour, or I have two, one day, or I have one month, no matter what it is. We suggest you on the blood thinner in case your risk with chest score is men above two and female above three. So you, everybody should get the blood thinner unless the patient does not want it or they have a high risk for bleeding risk. Usually renal function, liver function have to be checked before the procedure that is called. <coughs> everybody do that. And uh, in the patient with AFib, should be individualized and should be follow the patient wishes and discuss with the patient in the front. If the patient were in more stroke, then you probably say, okay, we take the risk for bleeding. If the patient says, I never want bleeding, never want transfusion, especially Jehovah's Jeho witness. witness persons, you have to be careful what they wishes because if they're bleeding, this is a big trouble. Okay, sometimes the patient has AFib, but they present with a more organized form we call atrial flutter. It's a debate. Some people research it, okay, if you have a typical atrial flutter, that means you have a big circle around right side upper chamber, and constantly in the situation, 
some research said there might be lower risk for the stroke, but there is no big clinical trial to convince that. that. So, so far in 2019, still suggests if you have a typical flood, no matter is left side or right side, you should take the blood in, even in a <coughs> more organized situation. And anticoagulation doesn't mean you have no anticoagulation, you have to take anticoagulation for whole life. So it should be intermittent re-evaluation the patient, what's your situation, and what's the risk potentially for you, and whether you need to take the blood in or not. For example, a lot of patients do after ablation, and they will continue to put the monitor on them, or they monitor at home by themselves. They do not have any atrial fibrillation for the next one year or two years. Do I need to take the blood in? It's a very critical clinic scenario and questions we have to answer. Unfortunately, the answer is we don't know. For the for example, if you have two years monitor with the review of the chips, they should be 24 hours, seven days a week monitor for you for the next last two years. And you don't have any effect. If we continue to put on the blood thinner, then we give you a 2% risk each year. And your risk for related to the AFib stroke is almost zero because you don't have AFib and we continue monitoring. So in this situation, the guideline Maybe in a couple of late slides I said, if that is a situation, you have to discuss with the patient. And if the patient has a high risk score, for example, if their CHAT2 score is above four, usually it's a high risk, four, five, six, then might a lot of people, expert opinion said, okay, in this situation, you probably still need to continue on your blood because we cannot predict you do not have AFib in the future and the monitor is not 24 hours, seven days, everybody monitor you at that time. But if you have a risk like CHET score is one or even two or zero, some people probably can stop the blood thinner. And a lot of physicians choose that way, and the people doing fine. So it's, it's the patient have to be continue re-evaluation each time you saw the patient in the clinic. What's the scenario with that? How much risk the patient has? And face the stroke potentially could happen. Usually for my practice, I say, okay, if you have a monitor and you don't see any AFib, then if your chest score is below three, then I might be saying, okay, if you're willing to take the risk, then we do it. But if you're above three, I prefer you continue with that. And if the patient do not have monitoring at home, and constantly be monitored by me or other physicians, or they do not do the monitor at home in the man, intermittent by like an Apple Watch or cardiac, then I prefer they continue taking because we really don't know. Sometimes they have AFib and the patient cannot feel it and put the patient at risk for stroke. So we do usually just continue with that. It's a very um, challenge uh, clinic scenario. So the other thing they suggest is a class one indication is a strong indication is if you take comedy and you never have a therapeutic treatment level, for example, this week I'm below 2.0, 1.3, 1.7, and next week I'm 3.5, 4.0. So the adjustable comedy dosage is very difficult. Then the new medicines is suggested because you do not need to be monitored. Most of the clinical trials say, okay, you just take the regular dose, you will be protected about the medication 60 to 70 percent decrease your risk for stroke. This is also frequently seen in the clinic zero. So if the man score is zero and woman is one, you, especially the woman because of the female that give you score one. So do they need anticoagulation? Usually in this scenario we suggest the patient unless, for example, if you do no plan for any 
invasive procedure like ablation, or if you have no plan for shock to bring the rhythm back in the next couple of weeks, then usually you probably do not need long-term anticoagulation because we see this kind of score is always risk for stroke less than 1%. And if you take a blood thinner, your annual bleeding probably around two. So they're bleeding more than twice as the stroke risk. So usually in this situation, we say, okay, for long term, we don't want it. Short term, depend what you plan to do, then we might be suggest you take short term. So there's, you will see the slide in the future. But if you have AFib and your charge score in two or above for men or three above for women, who have end stage renal disease and or who is on dialysis, what do we do? What kind of anticoagulant? If I have a bad kidney, if I on dialysis, what anticoagulant I can choose? Only two you can choose. Either adequate or warfarin. This is the only two medication you can choose. You cannot choose Neurotol for end stage renal disease and dimester. You cannot use Pradex. So whenever you have this, some people with this situation, the only two current from the guideline suggestion is only two medication. But maybe change in the future if the more and more data come out and different research show up. When you have a renal failure or, or on hemodialysis, um, the dosage should be adjusted. So this is why some people take Zorato 20, some people take Zorato 15. And when they do the adequate, some people take adequate 5 mg twice a day, and some people take 2.5 mg twice a day. For the products, the same thing. So some people take 75 twice a day, some people take 150 twice a day. This is just because your kidney function, whether your age above 80 years old, whether your kid, uh, body weight less than 60 kilos. So you have to adjust the situation and give the correct dosage for the patient. This is another scenario. <coughs> is I'm not three in men, uh, in two in men, and I'm not in three in women, what I should do. This is what I usually call reason. Your risks of stroke probably equal bleeding risk when you take the blood thinner. So this is the personal choice. I usually say, okay, what do you want? This is a gray zone. Either you take the 2% risk or either you take the 2% bleed. Some people say, okay, I don't like the risk of stroke, I take it. Then we usually say, okay, that's fine, then you, you take it. Whenever you're getting older or you develop a new problem like diabetes or coronary disease, then you definitely need to continue the blood thinning. So this is the good for me is this give a clear information. If you have a zero for men, one for women, you probably don't need long-term anticoagulation. If you have a man for one or woman for two, you probably personal choice. And if you have two or above the man or three above the woman, then you definitely need a blood thinning. And current clinical trials suggest if you can take Zerato, Perdax, uh, this new kind of anti-coagulation medicines is preferred than Coumadin. But patients have different financial issues, then sometimes they have to take the Coumadin. So this is the slide just to say, okay, if you have uh, AFib and you have end-stage renal disease, or you are on the dialysis patient. You cannot use Perdaxa, you cannot use Zerato or Cerveza. And it's not because the clinical trial is don't show the benefit, exists the risk. So they don't suggest at this time. The only choice will be what? Coumadin and Adipose.
So this is also the things it emphasizes because it's increased the patient risk and the patient death rate is high when you use superdexin compared you use coumadin for mechanical valve. This is clinical trial show up. So this is the emphasis. It's hard. So it's a, that means you definitely cannot use prodexin if you have a mechanical valve. So any other question for about how we use, what situation we use for the so far, okay. So the other problem I always frequent face is the bridging. Patient has the T pulled, I have a hernia repaired, or I have a spinal injection or knee injection. So the physician who do the procedure don't want to take the response. So I always get the <laughs> order say whether it's safe to stop it and you sign it and then I have to send to them and I will take the response for anything happened after that. <laughs> so bridge is usually have a two different... Is it knee injection? Like what kind of knee injection? If you can needle, spinal or knee inject. Some people do the knee pain. They do the steroid yeah. injection or something like that. Same thing for yeah, same thing for shoulder. Any, Cord any? Wait, so whenever I have a cortisone shot in my knee, I'm supposed to be off of Pradaxa? Some depend. For me, it's a very risk for low risk, low okay. risk for okay. bleeding. Okay. okay. But some doctors don't want to take the response. Hmm. And they just send to you to the letter, see whether you want to okay. stop it. And I say, okay, if you worry, then I'm stop it. Sometimes I say no. For example, they have a cataract surgery. Yeah. Sometimes say, okay, I request five days. I saw this. I require five days to stop the, the adipose. They want me to sign the paper. I say, no. Why? Because there's no blood in the eye. Mm -hmm. And why I should oh. take the patient to five days off the blood? Mm -hmm. So this is a different scenario in this situation. So when you bridge, Thanks. you usually use uh, Levonox. It's unfractionation heparin or uh, it's a, a regular heparin or low molecular heparin. With happening is a levonox. It's usually for the bridge. Mm -hmm. When you have a mechanical heart valve, this is interesting. In the old time, we only can use infraction to happen because it's more data shows it's helpful. At the very beginning, when the no levonox come out, they are not suggest for the mechanic valve uh, bridging. But now it looks like in the new guideline, you can use it. And How you bridge? What kind of patient you should bridge? And what kind of you think, okay, we're probably okay to do not need bridge. So this is depend on the surgery and the procedure. If you think about EGD, colonoscopy, injection, this is usually, or even to pull, is usually a low risk of bleeding and easy to stop. Usually, you can stop the blood thinner for about new blood thinner, we talk about Prodexa or something for 24 hours. And if you have a large bleeding risk surgery or spinal surgery, usually probably two to three days is better. So maximum, I usually say, some people say five, seven days. I think it's not make sense. Usually because all these kind of Brothin except Coumadin. Coumadin is a different story. If you take Prodexa, Aliquis, uh, Zerato, their half time probably between 12 hours to 18 hours. So that means every 12 hours, 18 hours, their blood level will be dropped 50%. Oh, 50%, yes. And after a couple of days, 48 hours, you probably nothing to block and your clot build. So their risk for bleeding is very low. Maximum three days probably for new anticoagulation medicine probably good enough. For Coumadin, different story, because Coumadin lifespan is long. Usually if you take the Coumadin, probably five days is better. So, but if the patient has a high risk of stroke, if you stop the Coumadin for five days, you give the patient a risk for stroke, and especially the surgical day, you probably don't have a blood thinner. 
after first 24 hours or even 48 hours after the surgery, a big surgery, the physician probably don't want you to resume the blood group. So you totally give the people probably seven to eight days with the community without anything and increase their stroke. So in this time, I usually give the bridge if the CHAT score, CHAT score is above four. The data shows that if you bridge in the people with CHAT score above four, with the heparin or lovenox, the stroke risk will be decreased and bleeding risk related to the after the surgery probably not that high. So you, the patient get benefit. But if your score is below three or lower than that, you probably do not need a bridge. But individual person has different story. We have some story I heard with Sharon told me is some people no appendage, low risk, but stop the blocking without bridge and he developed. This is the most people we think should not be developed, but he did develop. So individually, it's hard to predict. But I think reasonably, if you have a large surgery, if you, in your mind, in the future, you say, okay, this procedure is probably large, then I should at least two to three. If I'm risk is high for stroke, I have hypertension, diabetes, I have previous stroke, then I probably need to call Dr. Joe or my cardiology give me the Lovenox for a couple of days. Then we always can stop the, the Lovenox 12 or 24 hours before the surgery. So give you a decrease of risk for stroke. And after that, you can resume the blood thinner more quicker. Because in case you have bleeding, then you have an antidote for the happening. So this is in your personal mind. If a tooth bleeding, probably one day. If you have big surgery, abdominal surgery, chest surgery, or big vessel surgery, then it's high risk for bleeding, then we'll probably take two to three days before we stop before we started the surgery. And it's a, if it's elective and they're in a paroxysmal and they're in a fib at the time, you might put that procedure off a little bit. That mm -hmm. is tricky. For me, I usually, if it's urgent surgery, I yeah. they say, okay, we say you go to the surgery. And if you're not urgent, it's an elective surgery, mm -hmm. and your risk for stroke is less likely, I say, okay, go through the surgery, and we deal the broken remainder. But if you're high risk and your heart rate is not controlled, then usually I say, okay, if it's elective surgery, not urgent, then we postpone until we stay stabilized. Okay, you do not want to say, okay, I have AFib, I cut version today, and I'm going to go to surgery tomorrow. So that probably is increase your risk, because after the cut version, even you are back in the normal rhythm, but your chance for stroke sometimes even higher than you are in the effect. So we do not want you to stop the breath and you just get a cut and version back to normal rhythm. How long uh, are you in an elevated risk for a stroke after cardioversion? In the next two weeks. Okay, so for two weeks. Yeah, so this is why in the slide they will be discussed with this too. So this is, okay. well, in the future slide, I, there, there were a topic with um, how long you need to take blood thinner minimum before the shot, and how many uh, blood thinner you should take after the shot. Would that apply for a colonoscopy, for instance? Yes. Where, yeah. yeah, for me, colonoscopy is usually a low risk mm -hmm. procedure, or EGD, it's a low risk. You probably stop one day, is fine. But some people prefer two days maximum. I'm not no more than give them more than two days stop for the situation. Uh, there but are if you're in AFib, postpone it. Yeah. For me, if you have AFib, you're a high risk of patient. Mm -hmm. And usually I say, okay, if we try to stop the AFib quickly, then we stop the AFib quickly and give you two weeks later you do the, the chronoscopy. Okay. Because chronoscopy unless you have a yeah. Acute Emergency. issues. You have to do that. Then usually you can wait for two weeks. Then we say, okay, we wait until we deal with anything. And this is uh, the new antidote. If you have a truly with Perdexa or you take Zerato, if you have bleeding, what you 
you do now you have all the anti dot come out in the marketing you can use it. But I don't know whether EJ has both of them or this just only one of them. The they it's very expensive. They only have the uh, Prodaxel. So they don't have the new adequate. Solution. I don't even think, I don't even know if anybody in the city has. One of the people tell me that one of them is like uh, 4,000 or just one hand. Forty, forty-five hundred. The, the one for Zeralto and Eliquis is, I think, well more than four thousand. No. Excuse me, what are you talking about? The reversal agents, but it's not on the shelf here at EJ. I see. So there are some new interesting area in the last couple of years is beyond the medicine to prevent stroke, whether we can have other things to prevent a stroke. So there are a couple of things they talk about. This is, they talk about the watchman. We do not do watchman in the Egypt now because it's not profit, so hospital decided not to do it, but not means the patient do not need it. We have a lot of patients cannot take the blood and, and constantly leave it, and they are always at the risk for stroke. Their risk is high. This kind of patient usually should go to the watchman treatment, but unfortunately this hospital don't do that. So this is <coughs> one thing they can do like a catheter. You put the device from the groin, you do the transeptal, cross the water to the left side, and you put the, like an umbrella to close the ostium of the appendage area and totally seal them and prevent. But uh, it's a good part and it's a bad part. bad part is a, a lot of procedure related and then it's dependent on the physician how much experience they have then complication is different and uh, this is only shoes probably no less than the community equal to the community give you the protection the other thing is they can talk about surgical this is where some people we send them for for brothers so when we try to do convergent ablation for AFib and if the patient previously has a stroke or they have a clot found by the TEE before the procedure, we cannot do the procedure. Usually we hope we can change the different medication and the clot disappeared. And after that, I usually send the patient to Dr. Brother, he is CT surgeon, to clip the appendage. If they clip from during the procedure part, so they can clip the appendage from outside. And then, or some people have a bypass surgery. If you have an AFib, and you have a <coughs> bypass surgery or valve surgery at that time. And if the surgeon can take a little bit extra time, take your appendage out, and the patient will be get benefit. So this is why I usually told uh, people who plan to do the search, chest surgery, open chest surgery, and told them, you have AFib, please tell your surgeon to take your appendage out. And in the future, your risk for stroke will be significantly low. You compare you don't take your appendage out. But I thought you just said that it was equal to taking Coumadin, or did I misunderstand? Some people don't want to take Coumadin or cannot take a Coumadin. Okay, so removing the appendage... Remove appendage with surgical part, there is no head-to-head -head compared to issues. Okay. But in the history, we know it's decreased the risk for stroke. <coughs> for watchmen, the closure device, they do inside. Okay. They have a trial <coughs> compared to the Coumadin. They are okay. probably equal. But for the surgical take part, there is no study for that. But for the long history, we know from the Cox maze, we know if the patient did appendage out, because 90% of stroke from atrial fibrillation is from the left side appendage. If you take the left appendage out, then you decrease the 90% of risk to build a clot. But whether it's better than anybody, there is no clean to try. But it's so this is why they give a 2B. <coughs> it means we don't have a too much uh, research support this situation, but the patient might be benefit. If you already open the patient's chest, and the patient already know has an AFib history, they already take the blood thinner before, then take them out. And then you probably can stop the blood thinner after the procedure. To at least give some people in case they develop the bleeding in the future, then you say, okay, well, well, you already appendage up. You might be relative safer to to what, stop the blood. 
Dr. Joe, what you what you thought if <coughs> if somebody had an appendage out by a maze mm -hmm. and they left the the surgeon left a stub of the yeah. I personally think that also increased the patient risk depending on how much. They so have. that would be like it had they still had that appendage. Yes. Okay. You still I still treat with appendage. So this is very tricky. Is usually you will do the TE for for that particular patient to see how much pouch. Some people leave a very large pouch. It's depend. It's depend. I personally think it's depend on how experienced the surgeon is. Yeah, and some of them are old surgeries from so a long time ago. So if the surgeon is not familiar what they do, and they just think they take a piece of it and instead of the whole things, then probably it's not help. So the clot can still form. Yes. So this is for the rhythm control, is just for the antiarrhythmic medication. This is a very interesting scenario. It's probably not fit to everybody sit in this room because everybody already take the breath. This is very scenario in the ER. In the ER, a lot of patients will be faced with this situation. So this is the, you have AFib, all fluttering. You have more than two days go to the hospital, or even you don't know when my AFib or flood happened. I don't know the time. I cannot tell because I don't feel it. <coughs> what I should do. This is give you says, okay, if you don't know that, and if you still want to, this is my first time, but I just don't know when that happened. I still want my rhythm back. What I should do. How I take my blood in. So usually the guideline is, if it's not urgent, if your heart rate is slow, your symptom is not severe, and you do not want immediate cardiac version, then usually this is also your question. So you take minimum three weeks. Usually I give four weeks if you tolerate it. Three weeks before we cardiac version, no matter we use drugs or no matter we use electronic. And four weeks after, no matter your chest score. Okay? Regardless, the chest score. That means even your male with zero, or male with six, or female with zero, or female with six, I don't care. If you tell me this is my first time with, with this, or this is my second or third time, but I never take the blood in for a while, then I, if you not try to convert it today, I usually give you three days and four weeks after. Three days before, four weeks after, totally probably two months. No matter where risk is zero or your risk is pretty high, <coughs> ten percent or something like that. So everybody plan with this situation need anticoagulation. And after anticoagulation, you have to minimum take four weeks blood thinner. Even your risk score is zero. And for patient with AFib and flutter more than 48 hours and no duration, if you need immediately calibration because your hemodynamic state, because your blood pressure drop, because you sweat, because you're, you don't feel comfortable, so we need immediate calibration. Usually, anticoagulation should be initiated as soon as possible before the calibration. That means either the doctor give you a heparin injection subcutaneously, or you take Zerato, Perdexa, or Adequus a pill before it comes. Because this medication acts quickly. You do not use Coumadin. Because Coumadin needs to take about 33 hours to take some effect. So usually take a couple of days to reach the therapeutic. So Coumadin is not choice. If you're in the ER situation, or if you stop the Coumadin, blood thinner for a while, and suddenly your AFib reoccurs, and you go to the ER and need to be cardioversion, then ask the physician give you either injection or resume your Zorato adipus protection quickly before cardioversion, and then you can do it. And after cardioversion, and whether I need a long-term anticoagulation, this will be go back to the previous slide, is you have to discuss how my risk is, whether my risk is zero, whether my risk is five, 
that is depend on patient wishes, patient risk for stroke, and patient risk for bleeding. That is for the long term after four weeks. So after calibration, continue blood thinner for four weeks, and then discuss whether you need to continue it or just stop after four weeks. If your AFib, you know when that happened quickly. If you know your AFib is less than 48 hours, and but you have a high risk for stroke, means men for two above, female for three above, then you give the blood thinner as soon as possible before the cardioversion and is suggested. The next slide we'll be talking about, if your AFib will flutter with less than 48 hours and your chest score is zero for men and one for women, <coughs> you can give anticoagulation or even you cannot give anticoagulation before you shut it. That's fine. If they're very clear, my AFib less than 48 hours and my risk is very low and I want to shock quickly, then you can go forward, straight forward to shock and after shock they resume the blood thinning. But if you more than 48 hours or you even don't know how long with that, okay, and it's reasonable, you still want to get shock, then it's reasonable to say, you never take the blood thinner for longer enough for three to four weeks, but you still want, and your AFib is longer than two days, and you still want to convert it back to normal rhythm now, then we usually suggest, okay, we give you injection first, we do a TE. If your TE is negative for clot in the heart, then we will shock you or give you chemical to convert you back to normal rhythm. So this is the suggested means. So it's a little bit different scenario with different situation. More than 48 hours, less than 48 hours. Your high-risk patient or low-risk patient in each group. So in each different scenario, different group, we have a different strategy. Main idea is if you're high-risk, you prefer to get anticoagulation before you shock. Or if you're urgent, you need to shock immediately, do a TB. If you're a low-risk patient and your duration is less than two days, then you probably just can go for a straight shock and after that, take the blood. Uh, so this is the catheter ablation. This is the different topic we can talk about in the future. But we say, okay, if you have heart, this is the new guideline come out is if you have AFib and you're symptomatic with that, and also you have a heart failure, if you do the ablation, you might be decrease your potentially death rate and hospitalization. So in sin, this is a very select scenario. You have to think whether this atrial fibrillation contribute to frequent heart failure or not, and what kind of situation. Not everybody with heart failure and AFib should be go this way. So this is the give to be level. It's a very low level suggestion, but it's for some particular patient especially they have a heart failure, and whenever they have AFib, their heart function decreases, or they develop acute heart failure because their heart rate is too fast, they have a pulmonary edema. This kind of patient might be beneficial with the treatment if you can eliminate the atrial fibrillation episode in the future. Briefly talk. This is a lot of slide. I just give a brief talk. A lot of patient has coronary artery disease. They either have atrial fibrillation before they have a heart attack or stent procedure, or either they developed AFib during or after the procedure. So in this situation, what the current guidelines suggested, most of the people. Receive the coronary artery stents, usually received multiple 
anti-planet and anti-coagulation in this scenario. So increase the significant, increase the risk for bleeding because they take the Plavix, they take the aspirin, and they take the Zorato or whatever it is, Coumadin, whatever it is. So in that group of patients, usually is if the patient has to be take triple medication like aspirin, Plavix, and one of the anticoagulation, usually we suggest triple treatment is short, no more than four to six weeks. After four to six weeks, if the patient condition is stable, we try to take the aspirin off and you continue on the Plavix or anticoagulation. That means it's just two medications for the treatment, decrease the risk of stroke. More and more data shows two regime treatment compared to three regime risk. The clot build in the stand or heart attack happened probably not significant and the bleeding is significantly increased. So this is why all the next couple slides or about the AF combined with acute coronary syndrome is to see what happened, what suggests this major idea is some people in none we see more and more because aspirin is very common use in the last 10 years because the guideline at that time suggests every people has a coronary risk should take aspirin. Only aspirin has a, a take off this suggestion just happened in the last two to three years. So a lot of patients given by the primary care physicians because the guideline at that time suggests aspirin. So they continue aspirin. Now they develop the AFib. But they never have a coronary heart disease. They just maybe have a hypertension. So they, they were put on aspirin before. Then this kind of patient has, usually I suggest, you do not have a risk or increase the risk of stroke just because you take aspirin and adequate. You are more risk prone to bleeding if you combine it together. So usually this situation, you have to stop aspirin and just use one region. Mm. I think if you take aspirin with that, probably more, if you also take the Plavix, probably need to discuss with your cardiology or interventional cardiology to see whether I truly need three regime treatment or if I really need two regime treatment or I can just keep one blood thinner because I have AFib, but my stand is put in two years ago, three years ago, and I have no symptoms of chest pain. Do I really need Plavix? Do I really need uh, aspirin? If I suffer some people don't have like a coronary artery disease, do I really need aspirin to combine my adipose? So this is the question should ask if you take this regimen and go to talk, discuss with your interventional cardiologist to see whether we can decrease some bleeding risk. This is the, the medication for, for AFib with coronary artery disease, heart attack, what regimen you can use, and mutant disruption. This is the topic with antiarrhythmia medications. I, I probably don't talk too much about this. This is the interesting part. More and more people now have an Apple Watch. And some people have device, like a pacemaker, ICD, or some people because they syncopate, they black out. So they put the chips underneath their chest. And then suddenly they find their shot was AFib. So what do we do? For this situation, if the first time, I usually tell my patient, if this is the first time and it's a short duration, less than five minutes, you're probably okay. Your risk is probably not increased compared you do not have AFib. But you have AFib more than two hours or three hours and you even don't know. Then you have to be treat this kind of patient as a true AFib. <coughs> even the patient don't aware, but device will be detected. So it's depend on whether they are high risk patient, whether they are low risk patient, whether they have a frequent 
group group one minute two minutes stop and but they have multiple episodes a day or compared to they have one episode for a couple hours in patient room. So this is a very interesting scenario. And if you have um, with this situation, you probably need more focus to frequent check your device than usual. Usually device check every three, four months in the home setting. Or go to the doctor's office once or twice a year for the device checking face to face. That is not frequent enough. You probably if you find accident this probably talk to your doctor to see whether I can more frequently monitor or you can start at the home monitor by yourself. So this is the talk about the current device situation for monitored AFib. Some patients have what they call the cryptogenic stroke. That means you definitely have a stroke or you definitely have a mini stroke. But there's no they cannot find what reason to cause your stroke. You have your carotid is clean, your vessel is clean, and then you have no thrombosis, you don't have a hole in the heart. Everything cannot explain why you have stroke. Sometimes they say, okay, this situation you put a monitor. Some people maybe find have some intermittent episode of AFib. And we truly find some patient has a TIA and then when they have a monitor and they match to the AFib in the hospital. So we saw this kind of patient. So it's lucky and then they started the blood thinner and then they decreased their risk for stroke. This is probably the last uh, uh, slide. So this is an overweight obesity patient with AFib. With us is recommended. This is very interesting. If you obesity and you increase the risk, the AFib, this is no question about that. But there are some research in the two years ago and said if you feel obesity compared to normal weight person, if you take coumadin or Zerata, who have less risk for stroke? The people who have obesity. Yeah. It, it's very odd for me. <coughs> they cannot, the, 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 the author still cannot explain why. Because the, they have some lipoprotein maybe against the blood cloud build, they, they suspicion this, but they have not. But they do a large amount of the research. Their research is say, okay, we know obesity causes your coronary disease, increase your hypertension, cause the diabetes, cause a lot of trouble, sleep apnea, all those things. And also increase your risk for aphid. There's no question about that. But their study said, okay, if you obesity weight and you take the blood thinner, they only compare to coumadin and zerata. And if you obesity compared to people in normal weight, the obesity people has less stroke, more protective than the people has the normal weight. So I don't know, Pizza. but. <laughs> so and this is, is, is obesity still considered 20% above what your normal weight yeah. should be? Yeah. Yeah, the BMI above uh, 24 is obesity. So this is so the any questions? This is my last uh, slide. Uh, slide. Uh, hope I'm not confused because there's a lot of data, but I think it's very interesting because a lot of the questions I face. So the patient asked me, this is my question, this is my scenario, and what I should do. The good thing is the new update looks like answer all the questions and the suggestions in the current 2019 and give us a clear, okay, you should do this, you should do that. Any questions? Thank you. I guess I'm... I'm confused on the ablation versus med issue. Is that something that you fail meds and you then get ablation? If it's current guideline is, you do not want to use ablation as a first line. Okay, it's a more and more sure the benefit for ablation. But if the patient never treated with antiarrhythmia, the guidelines still suggest you treat one at least one antiarrhythmia medication before you jump into the procedure. The reason is multiple. For me is 
some people are responsible in their way. You can just take relative same medication and for a couple years without any episode. Some people just are so response so good and never need any involvement with them. Procedure is not a cure procedure. That means you do procedure, you never if it never come back. So procedure with current technology for paroxysmal probably around eighty percent. For persistent probably even lower. 50 to 60, depending on how aggressive we are. If you do aggressive persistent, like a brother and me to do the hybrid procedure for patient, then we are first year probably 80% for persistent, long persistent AFib. But if you do the regular, most of the center just do the regular ablation by the EP physicians, then the persistent atrial fibrillation successful rate in the first one or two years even lower than 80%. Also, you have risk related to the procedure. For example, stroke risk. Stroke risk is not high, probably one or even less than one. But if you have it, the patient has 100% with a stroke. And also you talk about death rate less than one, but if you have some complications, some people died with like an AV fib, esophagus, atrial fistula, there is a hole between the heart and the esophageal because they do ablation, they damage the two tissues, the ursa happen, they make a hole, and the patient die with this situation. And we saw that a lot of things happened in the different center in town. Not here. And so this is, the, you have to Thank be... You. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. You, you have to be considered what the benefit the patient gain and what fit risk the patient face and balance each other and make that decision. And if, you oh, I'm sorry. if you have multiple ablations, does it start having scar tissues to where you can't do it? Uh, this is probably, you don't have AFib. If you have too much scar tissues, you have no survive heart tissue, you probably don't have AFib. So that means some people do multiple Procedures mostly is still limited. It depends. Uh, if you do too aggressive, then the heart will become a totally scar tissue. It's like a stone. So it's more trouble than good. So you do, if you do the ablation, you do not want to damage all the tissues. If you damage all the heart tissues, become all the scars. True, your AFib will be disappeared because there's no fundamental area or substrate that them to fit. But in the same scenario, patient will be has a constantly with fluid retention, pulmonary edema, all that situation. Mm -hmm. Because you damage the cells too much, you damage the hormones secret by the heart and the fluid cannot go out from your body and then you make more trouble than you. So you have to balance. Um, for me, I usually do not want to continue doing that. Most of the procedure we do probably two. McKinney and I usually cut them up at two procedures, do one or two. <coughs> if it doesn't work, and if we see a lot of scar already built in the heart, usually we prefer not to do it. Because we can do third. Some people some centers, some doctors do three or four times. And while I was a fellow in the mail, a, a gentleman, 91 years old, he do five. The reason is he pushed the doctor to admit each time he do a ablation, he can have a good one year or one half year. He feels so good. And then when he flare back in, he can just no quality of life. He just continue pushing. So that is my, when I was a fellow, this is the, Oldest person I joined the case with my attending is 91. And he is the fifth. The physician don't want to do it, but he pushed my attending to do it, and then they really do it for him. But usually where I practice and with McKinney, we usually probably limit it to one procedure to two procedures. Some people do the hybrid procedure first, and if they flip back with some AFib, then now usually it's okay. If you really cannot leave it, then we do it. So I will usually do two. Do I do three? As um, I remember. Mm -hmm. well, I, I remember one patient that we did um, a pulmonary vein 
then we did a conversion, then he came back with a typical A flutter. And we did, a. we did that. And since that, he's had like zero for like four years. Okay. And he was like a 15 year persistent patient. So, so we just different, it's different scenarios. Usually I personally, when I was in there, I usually do a lot of detailed mapping. So give me a basic idea if there are a lot of patches, that means unhealthy tissues. And I know that potentially troublemaker is too much. And you don't want to kill all of them. Because you kill all of them, the heart is no healthy tissues and you make the patient more trouble. We have one person who died with that, right? He sent him to the doctor. It's a it's an old gentleman, Dr. McKinney sent him to Oh, oh yeah. Te Texas. They do good. They have no He, he went to all. Texas on his own. But he, he was constantly, a, constantly um, has yeah. a pulmonary edema because mm -hmm. the heart is not functional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so the hybrid um, ablation, that's like 80% effective. Is that just within the first year or? Mm -mm. Good question. I don't have more than first two years data. I'm not connected okay. with that. I'm trying to connect with it because we slowly, so we continue doing that. We, I saw some more people three or five years still maintaining over. After the heart. After heart. And I personally think if you have a persistent defect more than then one year, that's a long persistent defect, that means you constantly in the defect more than one year, you definitely will be benefit just straight go forward for the hybrid in the very beginning. Because that will give you a better chance for single procedure. Mm -hmm. um, but some people don't like Convergent because it's more traumatic, they feel more painful, and uh, they stay in the hospital longer. So they don't <coughs> want to like the convergent procedure. So they say, okay, let me try the sim simple catheter ablation first. If I'm lucky on the response, then I can avoid the more traumatic procedure. So it's, it's dependent patient wishes. If the patient usually do the procedure, like single test of procedure before and fail, then I usually not redo procedure myself because I feel I'm lucky brother can help me. If the surgeon don't help me, then I don't have this technology, then I have to do by myself. Then you have just like multiple center, you have to see, they have to do two times or three times and get the 80, 85% any other questions good so any suggestions because now I'm running <laughs> I just don't know whether everybody still want me to two times or three times a year to continue doing that oh yeah because we can't absorb all of this at one time so I mean it's like then we'll share and I will be <coughs> continue doing this, hope the program McKinney built and yes. still survive and we continue. Oh yes. Uh, to She's come back. And then we, if you have any suggestions or any topic interesting, then we can ask some other physicians to come here to, to give you guys a talk. Since I'm new to the group, I like to hear some of the past and I know I've looked online for past mm -hmm. You couldn't find me? No. I can only find two. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to meet them. I'm going to, um, I have a meeting with marketing because I look today and I can only find two. And we've filmed every one of them. Who are you trying to find? The, the past talk. So, yeah. Past past talk. Like Dr. Dr. Brothers gave a really good one. That's, that's fine. That's, well, that's fine. So we can ask the public.